Hello and welcome to Unworthy History. We bring you actual history that you won't find on TV channels like the History Channel. Now today I'm going to bring you another story from this excellent book, Indian Depredations in Texas. I think this is one of the best old books we have uh, about the history of uh, Comanche and Texas uh, fights on, along the frontier in the 1800s. And so today I'm actually going to read the first story of this book. Uh, this is something that readers who are steeped in Texas history have probably heard about. Uh, it's a story about uh, the kidnapping of Matilda Lockhart uh, and her friends, the Putnam children. Uh, so just to give you, you know, a little warning, uh, this story uh, it doesn't have as uh, good of an ending as some of the stories that we've had uh, on this uh, channel. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and uh, read it today. This happened, uh, basically it was kind of an early uh, story in this book. It happened in the 1830s, around 1838. Uh, near DeWitt County, and this actually precipitated a lot of the major events that followed uh, that I've done some previous episodes on. So there was the Council House fight. Uh, this, per, this kidnapping of Matilda Lockhart preceded that, uh, and then also uh, that Council House fight led to basically uh, a battle between uh, the Comanches and Texans who had met there. Uh, and then that led to the raid on Linville and Victoria. And then uh, eventually the uh, revenge on that raid by the Texans uh, at the Battle of Plum Creek. Uh, so I did several episodes about that uh, a while ago. And you can check those out if you want. But this is going to be where it started uh, with the kidnapping of Matilda Lockhart uh, and the Putnam children. The Comanche Indians were to Texas what the Pequot Indians were to New England and what the Sioux were to the traders and trappers of the West. Their incursions were for many years a terror to the border settlers of Texas, for they were a warlike, cruel, and treacherous tribe, and as they always traveled on horseback, they could swoop down unexpectedly from their distant stronghold upon the settlements, commit murders and depredations, and retreat before any effective pursuit could be made. It was a party of this tribe of Indians who captured the young lady whose sad story we are about to relate. Her father, Andrew Lockhart, emigrated from the state of Illinois in the year 1828 and settled on the Guadalupe River in what is now DeWitt County, then DeWitt's colony. It was the fall or winter of 1838 that Matilda Lockhart, Rhoda Putnam, Elizabeth Putnam, Judah Putnam, and James Putnam left the houses of their parents one day and went to the woods to gather pecans. While they were thus engaged, a party of Indians suddenly rushed upon them. They discovered the Indians too late to escape and were all captured. When the Indians first came in sight, Miss Lockhart fled for the house and possibly might have escaped had not the youngest Miss Putnam employed her not to leave her. The noble girl, pitying her youthful companion, turned to aid her, and both were captured. The Indians fastened these unfortunate captives on horses with rawhide thongs and hurried off with them into the Guadalupe Mountains. Captain John Tumlinson, who was out on a surveying expedition, encountered these Indians, but as he had but six men with him and the Indians numbered at least fifty, he was compelled to beat a hasty retreat. He did not know at the time that they had prisoners with them. The Indians followed Captain, Captain Tumlinson and his men about 24 hours and probably would have killed them all if they had not accidentally discovered that they were still in pursuit of them, long after they supposed the chase had been abandoned. The party, as they were traveling along leisurely, saw a black stump ahead of them, and supposing it was a bear, the men halted for the purpose of killing it. Captain Tumlinson rode forward to shoot the supposed bear, and as he did so, one of the men behind happened to look back and discover the Indians still following their trail. The alarm was given, and the cap captain and his men hastily continued their retreat. After running about half a mile through the prairie, they came to some timber where they fell in with a large drove of Mustang horses. The frightened animals divided into squads and ran off in various directions. Captain Tumlinson and his men wisely followed one of these squads, thereby making it difficult for their pursuers to find their trail, and they so escaped. 
This raid of the Indians so terrified the settlers on the west side of the Guadalupe River that they had abandoned their homes and forted together on the east side. When Captain Tumlinson arrived at the west side of the river, he found that all the houses in the settlement were deserted. He knew nothing of the capture of Miss Lockhart and the young Putnams until he crossed the river and reached the house of Mr. William Taylor, where he first heard the sad story. A company of men was immediately raised who went in pursuit of the Indians, but all to no purpose. They had got too far ahead to be overtaken. The poor captives were carried far into the Indian country, where they suffered terribly from hunger, hardships, and exposure to the inclemencies of the weather. During her captivity, Miss Lockhart said that sometimes she had to travel from 50 to 75 miles a day on a bareback horse, and that seldom a day passed that she was not severely flogged. In the winter of 1839, a party of these same Indians took up their quarters on the San Saba River, about 100 miles above where the city of Austin now stands. Information of this rendezvous was given to Colonel John H. Moore of Fayette County, who raised a party of about 60 men, and accompanied by a party of Lipan Apache Indians, he went to their encampment and attacked them, when a desperate fight ensued. Miss Lockhart was in the Indian camp when this attack was made. Knowing it was made by white men, she screamed as loud as she could, hoping that they would hear her and come to her rescue. The Indians, suspecting the cause of her screaming, drowned her cries with their louder yells. When, and when she persisted, one of them nearby became so exasperated that he seized her by the hair of her head and tore out a large part of it. The father of the unfortunate girl was with the attacking party under Colonel Moore, and it was with a heavy heart that he returned to the settlement without his daughter, who had been a prisoner for over a year, for whom he felt quite sure was in the Indian village. Upon one occasion, a party of Indians who had Miss Lockhart in possession came within one or two days' travel of San Antonio and pitched their camp. As they knew she was aware of their proximity to the white settlements and fearing she might attempt to escape, they severely burned the soles of her feet to keep her from running away. Not a great while after this treaty was made with the Comanche Indians, under which Miss Lockhart was delivered up to the Texas commissioners at San Antonio and subsequently sent back to her family. But the once sprightly, joyous young girl, whose presence had been everywhere like a gleam of sunshine, penetrating the gloom of the wilderness, was a mere wreck of her former self. Her health was almost utterly ruined by the privations and hardships she had undergone and the brutal treatment to which she had been subjected to by her, her captors. When captured by the Indians, Miss Lockhart was only about 13 or 14 years of age. She was given over to the squaws, whom she served in the capacity of a slave. Their treatment of her was much more cruel than that of the bucks. The numerous scars upon her body and limbs bore silent testimony of savage cruelty. The ladies who examined her wombs after her reclamation, some of whom are yet alive, stated that there was not a place on her body as large as the palm of the hand which had not been burned with hot irons. After lingering some two or three years, she died. Her father was a brother of Bird Lockhart, for whom the town of Lockhart in Caldwell County was named. As to the Putnam children, the son was reclaimed many years afterwards. He had acquired many of the habits of the Indians and spoke their language. We have been informed that Rhoda became the wife of a chief and refused to return home. Elizabeth was finally reclaimed, but Judah Putnam remained a captive among the Indians for about 14 years. She was several times sold and once was purchased by a party of Missouri traders, who after retaining her for some time, sold her to a man by the name of Chenault, who subsequently moved to Texas and settled in, the Gonzales, in Gonzales County, the same section in which Miss Putnam had been captured by the Indians. With this man she had lived seven years. The citizens of Gonzales County, knowing that she had been an Indian captive and seeing the strong resemblance she bore to the Putnam family, came to the conclusion that possibly she might be the long-lost Judah Putnam. After a time, the Putnam family began to look into the matter and questioned her in regard to her parentage and former life. 
She had forgotten her own name and could tell nothing of her life prior to the time the Indians captured her, and of that event she had but a dim and uncertain recollection, as she was only about seven years of age when she was captured. A sister of hers said on one occasion when speaking of the matter that if this lady was really her long-lost sister, she could be identified by a most singular mark on her person. An examination was made by the sister, uh, so this must have been Elizabeth and some other ladies, and the mark was found precisely as it had been described. This, together with her striking likeness to the family, left no doubt in the mind of anyone that she was the identical Judah Putnam who had been captured by the Indians in Gonzales County 21 years before. Thus, after 14 years' captivity among the Indians and seven years with Mr. Chenault, was this young lady by a train of circumstances brought back to the very spot from whence she had been stolen, and by the merest chance was recognized and restored to her relatives. Verily, truth is often stranger than fiction. So that was the end of uh, this story right here. So this was uh, focusing first on Matilda Lockhart and then also the Putnam children who were kidnapped at the same time. Uh, but of course, you know, this story uh, didn't have a great outcome. It had uh, some very uh, disturbing and unfortunate things, uh, particularly to Matilda Lockhart. Uh, but, you know, that's part of uh, history, and I think it's important to, uh, you know, show that. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.